Hey everyone, Mike here. What you're about to watch is a clip from the DevOps Lounge stream. If you'd like to join us, then head on over to chat.learndevops.com.au. See you there. Uh, one of the first questions I wanted to look at uh, effectively involved uh, improving Terraform code. So how do you go about improving your Terraform code quality? So I wanted to just cover some tips with regards to this, with regards to Terraform code bases in general, simply because there are, in my experience as a contractor moving around between many organizations, it's very easy to come across code bases that have been written by people who have learned Terraform very quickly in a very short space of time. They've had a requirement to build something complicated, and so they've sort of just done the best that they can. And they generally have done the best that they can. And so there are definitely some very quick things that can be done straight away to vastly improve the quality of any Terraform code base that you might come across. So if you move into an organization that's got existing code or you're writing code from, from scratch from today onwards, perhaps, then these are just some quick tips that you can use to vastly improve the quality of your code. So we're gonna be looking at some best practices. We're gonna be looking at some coding standards, things like using file names, using the linters and things like that. Bit of code organization as well as what we're gonna be looking at. So the first thing I wanna cover is coding standards. So what does what does that even mean? Now with 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 Terraform you're obviously producing HashiCorp configuration language, which is just the configuration language that you're using in order to define resources and your data blocks and your pull information, so on and so forth. And you're going to use a configured provider block in order to essentially talk to something like AWS or GCP. And you're then going to configure resources inside of that of that provider, right? That's what you, that, that's the reason why you're using Terraform. So to do that, you're going to be writing code. So how do you write code in a way that is of a high standard? Well, there's a few things you can do. Now we're going to pop over here to a web page. So we can see here uh, we have a repository from a guy called Chris Matteson. So this gentleman actually works at HashiCorp, but as you can see, he's just putting up here that it's not the official endorsed set of standards from HashiCorp. It's just his personal opinion. Now this is a very in-depth documents. I'm not going to obviously sit here and read all this document to you. Uh, there's lots in here to go through. I wanted to point out that you've got this kind of thing. You've got HashiCorp. I've got some official guidance. Rackspace even have a page on coding standards as well. And if you do a Google, you'll see that there is actually quite a bit out there. But I actually wanted to cover some very sort of, sort of high level things that will basically get you get you started to a, to a, in a great way like you, you'll be off to a good start straight away just with these very very simple standards and then we can look at um, some other things as well further down the line so these are things that are going to have a big impact so the first one is using file names to your advantage. So when you're writing code, you're writing HashiCorp code, you're gonna be putting it inside of a file, obviously. You're gonna be writing that file to disk. You're gonna be committing it to a Git repository. What you wanna do is you wanna use a file name that is going to help you further down the line and it's gonna help someone else further down the line. If you just created a file called say code.tf and you just put everything in there and you've got hundreds and hundreds of lines of of code, it would become difficult to find specific things. You'd have to start using the search functionality of your IDE, so VS Code, for example, to start typing in keywords and, and looking for things. Then, uh, indeed, what do you actually look for? What do you actually type? If you're looking for the name of a specific resource and so on and so forth, it becomes very unwieldy, it becomes very difficult. So there are a few things that you can do to improve this straight away. My advice is to use a file called main.tf 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 for your provider and your terraform configuration chris has a slightly different opinion on this he thinks that the should be terraform.tf for the terraform file and stuff like that either or you want to put you want to have a main.tf because most programming languages especially coming out from the sort of the history of c and c plus they have like a main.c file or a main.cpp file and even in python main.py is a very common convention that people use when they're writing software. If you have a main.tf file, it acts as the entry point to the code base. People can go to that straight away. And what they'll see 
if you stick to this kind of advice is they'll see the meta the sort of meta configuration around your terraform code so they'll see the provider block they'll see the terraform block so they'll know if there's a remote workspace being used in terraform cloud they'll see where your uh, state is being stored whether you're using locking and then when they look at the provider blocks they'll see whether you're you're, you're using you're using aws or you're using gcp or you're using azure or DigitalOcean, or you're using a combination of these things so that's actually a really great way of just getting an entry point into the code base is to use something like a main.tf the next tip i can give you would be around using file names that reflect the service that the code is managing so for example a good example of that would be s3.tf well what do we think would be inside of s3.tf i think it's safe to say it's going to be something related to amazon s3 so it's going to be s3 buckets most likely or even s3 objects so if i'm entering into your code base for the first time it's a module say it's got six seven maybe eight files and i want to manage anything to do with the S3. So, for example, you've asked me to add an extra S3 bucket. I know that if I go to the S3.tf file, it's very likely that that's where I'm probably going to find the S3 buckets. It's probably where I'm going to want to add that in there. So, that's a good practice is to name the file after the service that it's actually managing. I am underscore policies.tf. What do we think would be inside of that file? It's probably safe to say that it's going to have. I am policies in there. I am policy documents, as well as the actual, which is a which is a localized sort of Terraform thing. You write out the document in HCL, and then you actually create the policy in AWS using that as a as a data source that then feeds into the policy and is and is uploaded for you. That makes it very easy to find in your code base where those policies are. Another one is placing your variables inside of variables.tf. So it's actually variable, the variable name, and then you open the block. So by putting them in variables.tf, and again, if this is a module, for example, then I know where the inputs to that module are going to be because those variables act as inputs to a module. So if you use variables.tf, I know where to go to add, an, to add an input, to edit an input, or delete an input. You've asked me to update the modules inputs, I know where to go, just go to variables.tf. The same applies to outputs as well. If your primary piece of code is managing state or it's a module, use outputs.tf. So that, that way I know where the output blocks are. I can go straight there and I can add, remove, or edit any any outputs as necessary. This makes it just much easier to just manage the code overall, especially again with regards to modules. Uh, things like locals, local blocks, so local variables that are not inputs, they're just sort of inside of that code, inside of the scope of that code. Locals.tf, really, really simple, really, really sort of quick, easy way of just organizing code straight off the bat. That will improve things quite nicely for you. That's a bit of organization around file names and using file names to your advantage. What about the style of the code as well? So you've, you've got your files, you've got your s3.tf, you've got your main.tf, you've got your outputs.tf. But what about the actual style of the code itself? So what we can do there is we can use a built-in tool called Terraform FMT. So the actual Terraform binary itself has Terraform has a subcommand called FMT, Terraform FMT. This allows you to format the code inside of the current working directory. So if you have three or four TF files in there and you run that command, it will go through them. It will look for stylistic issues, linting problems as they're called and it will lint the code and it will actually update the files. It'll actually write the changes. It, 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 it'll make the changes to the code in memory and it'll write them to the files. It'll actually edit the files for you. That's a great way of ensuring that everyone is writing code to the same standard. So you should actually be making sure that Terraform FMT is being used by your IDE. So if you're using VS Code, you can grab a Terraform plugin and it will do this in the background for you. So whenever you make changes to the code and you do control S to say, the file it will actually do an fmt in the background for you and it will actually then lint the that will lint the code and then i will feed in and then vs code will update with the fully linted code for you it's just it's easy it's quick and in this case it's, it's literally free it's just a plugin vs code is free the plugin is free super super simple super super easy if you get everyone doing this across the team that immediately raises the standard of code quality straight across the team 
in an instant, everyone is writing code to the same standard. The next one is comments. Now this one, you don't actually see all that often, but comments are actually a really powerful way of explaining a complex problem. So if you've got some Terraform code that you're writing, and a good example of this would be like a CloudFront distribution. AWS CloudFront distributions are very, very powerful, but also very, very complicated. And so they can take up a significant amount of code in a file. So I would say that that's a good candidate for marking certain parts of the distribution with comments to explain what these rules do, what this case behavior does, and so on and so forth. If someone new is coming into the team or even a junior is looking at the code, it makes it easier for them to be able to manage that code because the comments help them understand these complex problems. Because although it would be great if this code was perfect documentation, you know, code as documentation, it's not doesn't really work in reality because the code can be com too complex to essentially be a form of documentation there's too much assumptions being made by that code so using comments to ensure that you're outlining what a complex piece of code does helps onboard other people very very quickly onto that code base now another one i see often and i recommend a lot is pinning versions so that's looking at the versions of modules that you're consuming even if they're modules that you've written yourself internally or they're public modules from the hashicorp registry or some private registry make sure that you're actually pinning to a particular version of that module the reason for that is quite simple if you download version one of the module and it's working for you fine and all of a sudden version two comes out and you're not pinned against version one version two might not have been developed in a as we call it semantic fashion that is they may just go version two there it is and it breaks everything because it's changed the way resources are being managed it might have changed the names of resources internally inside the module so when you do a terraform plan you're going to see lots of things being rebuilt lots of things being destroyed lots of things being um, basically undesirable side effects and if you have that in a ci pipeline you might not catch it if you're really really brave and you're just doing your terraform apply terraform apply would auto approve and you're not checking plans it's probably not the best idea then it's possible that you could get things things could go wrong very very quickly however if you pin the version to version one then you end up in a situation where that change does not affect you at all you can do a review you can go oh there's version two you can go and check it and then you can you can do a, a, pl a planned release of version one to version two you can see all those nasty side effects and you can say that's not good we we, we can't do that and then you can plan around it a lot of people don't actually realize as well that you can actually pin the version of a provider in, in Terraform. You can you can pin the version of a provider. That's also another good idea. If you're if you're using version 3.5 of the AWS provider, say 3.5.0, and that's working fine for you, it's possible and perfectly reasonable to say, well, unless there's a really critical security update or something that we actually need as a feature, then you just pin against 3.5.0. Don't don't just let it continuously upgrade to four to five to the major version four to major version five, because again it could change something about the API that means that your code no longer functions. So what I would say is pin the version, and you can even pin it in a way that it lets you pin the major and the minor version, so 3.5, and then the patch version. You can say just accept anything that comes through because generally something like the AWS provider is being very well maintained. It's being written by people who are using proper semantic versioning. And what they're saying is if the patch version updates, it's going to be backwards compatible with your current use case of that provider. So pin your versions and just prevent any sort of accidental resource deletion or problems further down the line just by simply just pinning a version. It's very quick to do. It's very easy. The final thing I want to look at is testing so there are lots of ways to test terraform code as in there are lots of third-party tools there's terra test which someone actually just linked there in the chat thank you for it there's there's a couple of other ones there's one based on python if you don't into go terra test requires you to write go code there's one based on python it requires you to write python code there's others that don't require you to write code but what i want to talk about are just some really simple internal pieces of functionality that are just essentially just built straight into terraform and you just use straight out the box straight away. And again, this is just very quick tips to get you up and running straight away. Okay, so you've got Terraform format again. So Terraform FMT, like I said, that will look at linting problems, find them, and it will write them to, to disk. But if you run it in check mode, it doesn't do the write to disk. It'll just check. And then if it finds problems, it then throws up 
problem. I found these files. These got problems in them, and the exit code. This is the important part. The exit code from Terraform FNT will be non-zero. Now that's a Unix. Um, that that basically stems out of sort of Unix, and it's essentially if the error, if the exit code is non-zero, it means there was a problem. So a zero exit code means that that last command was successful. And CI pipelines, Jenkins, GitLab CI, and so on and so forth, they sort of rely on that as well as other things to determine whether or not the command that you just executed was successful or not, and whether I should continue the pipeline, should I stop executing this pipeline, because that command didn't return a zero state code, so does that mean there's a problem? You tell me, I'm just going to assume that it's a problem, so I'm going to stop. So Terraform FMT uses that concept, and it will return a non-zero status code if there's a problem with the code. That means that if people aren't running Terraform FMT locally, you're not enforcing a development environment, you're letting people use whatever they want, you can do Terraform format inside of a CI pipeline, and you can reject any pull requests that don't pass this very simple linting test. Straight away, just like that, you've 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 put a wall in front of your production environments and your production code bases. That means that people have to work harder to be to, to get code into into production, which is important. So they have to lint their code and they have to be producing code that is consistent across the board. Really, really quick one. The next one is Terraform validate. So this is another sub command built into the Terraform command. In fact, all of these are just built in to the Terraform command. This will check for syntax problems. It'll check for references to variables that are that don't exist. Are you trying to call a module in an invalid way? Is your version constraint that you've put on there is that even valid? If it's not, then I, I, well, it shouldn't run, right? Shouldn't the code is the, the code shouldn't execute because it's you're expecting one thing, but Terraform can't give you can't deliver that state that you're asking for, and so it rejects. And again, this is something that you can just put inside of a CI pipeline. We've received some code. It's passed the lint and check. Let's actually validate it and make sure that it works. I'll give you a heads up though. In most cases, in order to do a validate, you've got to be able to do an init as well. So if you're using modules that are external, say in private registries and things like that, and they can't just be pulled from the public internet, your Terraform init inside of your CI pipeline is going to have to be configured in a way that allows it to pull those, pull those modules down. So if there are credentials or access controls in place, you're going to have to work around that to make sure that the init can actually pull that stuff down. But that's a really, really quick way of just validating the code from a, from a Terraform perspective. Now, even though Terraform has validated and gone, that's all great, it doesn't mean that the actual provider, for example, AWS, doesn't mean that the provider itself is actually happy with the code and the configuration that you're given it. You might, Terraform might say to you, hey, that AWS subnet looks great, but AWS might not be happy with the CIDR range. It might not fit inside the VPC, or it might just be outright invalid. It might only have three octets instead of four. Okay, so how do we how do we get around that? Well, if permittable, in some cases it's not. We have some people in the chat, for example, who simply are working at scale that it's just it's just too long it's just sorry it's just too big the scale is just too big so they, they they might not be able to do this but in most cases you might actually be able to just do terraform plan terraform apply and a terraform destroy if you can get a pull request to come in and you can do that loop then you might find that you can actually do a full end-to-end -end test of the code to ensure that the actual provider itself aws gcp Azure, whatever it is is actually also happy with that code because ultimately if they're not if it's not then the code isn't valid right it doesn't matter if telephone saying terraform saying that the syntax is correct there's no point in having perfectly formed code if the if aws doesn't actually can't can't accept the code because it's actually bad 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 um bad code bad configuration so it can actually be worth doing a plan apply and a destroy as and when possible based on the size of your environment. So that's just some simple tips that you can use just to really greatly improve the quality of a Terraform code base pretty much overnight, to be honest with you. Like they're not really that hard to get in place. You can you can put your pin versions, you can just pin to the latest version. If that's what's working for you now, you can pin straight away. Those tests can be put away, can be put into place in a CI pipeline instantly. Comments can take a little bit longer, but you can just start sort of start it now. And as you go and you manipulate the code, you can start add them in as you go and you find complex pieces of code. Terraform formatting, linting that code locally and in a CI pipeline, it's just a single command and a single plugin for your for your IDE. Most common IDEs will have this. And using the right file names is also something you can just do as you go along. Easy. Very nice.